Hey guys, this is Shane here with Echo Soundworks. In this video, we're gonna look at 19 tips, tricks, techniques that you can use to make your drums sound more unique, more interesting, and ultimately more professional. So if you are kind of in this place where you think your drum grooves, your patterns, they just sound more beginner, more like an amateur, then you want, check this video out. So before we dive right into things, I wanna kinda of outline how I'm sectioning off the different concepts and ideas in this video. The first part is gonna focus on the sounds of the drum pattern or groove, right? And the first thing we're gonna talk about is sound selection, sample selection, and then expand on that idea. All right, so the second element or broad category is the rhythm, the rhythmic aspects that make a groove a groove. And then third, we're gonna look at mixing and processing. So let's dive in and get started. So the first thing we have to talk about is sound selection. I know some of you guys out there will be rolling your eyes because this is like a common trope, but I wanna show you something. I wanna show you a drum loop that's using just stock drum kits in Logic Pro X, just using the stock Atlanta kit. And then I'm gonna show you the exact same pattern rhythmically using cooler samples, samples that are more unique. Here is the more kind of beginner drum pattern. All right, now here is again, the same pattern rhythmically, right? I'm just using better samples. Right, so it is crazy that this is basically the exact same pattern rhythmically and it sounds so different. So it really does boil down to sound selection and sample choice. I've never seen a video, whether it's on YouTube or even like a masterclass that dives into the subject because they'll just always be like, it's subjective, choosing the right sample is subjective. Well, that doesn't help people who are beginners. If you're a beginner, you're gonna be making a lot of poor choices musically. It's you just don't have good taste yet. That's one of the biggest hurdles you have to overcome. So I gave a lot of thought to how I could present something tangible, something for you, for you producers out there who are struggling with sample selection and sample choice to have a better starting point. So here is my advice to you. The first thing you should do is get really well acquainted with the classic drum machine sounds. So things like Roland TR 909, 808, 707, 606, maybe a Lindrum if you do pop and you know synth wave, disco pop. If you do hip hop, early MPC samples, and then there's some Elise drum machines as well. And that's just as a starting point. But those drum machines and those sounds, that's actually what producers refer to as being boring and basic. If we go back to these two yellow tracks here, these sounds are basically all from a combination of a TR 909 and 808 basically with a little bit of processing. So unprocessed vintage drum machine samples to a lot of producers will sound boring or cookie cutter, right? But there are times where you need to use those types of samples. So that's why you need to get well acquainted with them. So you know how to make your decision in the next step of the process. So the next step is gonna be ask yourself the purpose of your music. If you're making music as your own artist project and you want to craft something unique sonically with your drums, you definitely want to mess around and try to find something unique and special to you. Think about like Timberland from the 90s. He he did a lot of ethnic world drums, the beatboxing, such an iconic drum sound, right? Or something like this. It's really unique. But this won't always work. Let's say you're working for a client and they have a specific reference. Like let's say a rapper comes up to me, says, Shane, can you make me a beat that sounds like something the baby would rap over? And I'd be like, okay. I can't give him this drum loop. I, honestly, the kick and snare from this would sound closer to what he's going for. It's just, I need to now find a way to make that interesting. And now that I know I can't choose just any old kick and snare, because it needs to sound like a baby track, I need to now think about, well, how am I gonna make this interesting? Well, I can't make it interesting with my sample choice. I'm kind of shackled. Well, what about the rhythm? What about the tempo? What about other things we're gonna look at in this video? Now that, same idea applies to things like when you're working for or working on a song that you want to pitch to a label and the label has a specific sound like house tracks, right? You're going to use a lot of the classic drum machine hi-hats for it. It just is what it is. Or you're working for TV, film, and sync. There's You get a brief and you have to write a track that sounds a certain way and you can't deviate. These things help will help you make the right choices because you can think, oh, if they want a track that sounds like X, Y, and Z, I need to have the snare from X, Y, and Z. 
All right, so the second thing we're gonna look at is the idea of layering sounds to create a more unique sound. Now, this goes hand in hand with sound selection, right? Like I talked about before and briefly, you cannot just try to have tons of weird sounds. It usually won't fit the role of what a label is asking for, a client, or it won't fit a genre, right? But there are those sounds within every given drum kit or loop that you're making or pattern that you're making where you can start to go left of center and start to do some interesting things. And you can layer sounds to do that. All right, so to look at our layering concepts, I've opened up a different session and we have a disco pop synth wave loop. Now, we're going to look at how I use layering to make this a little less unabashedly 80s. So let's peel back some of the layers that I applied and we'll go to just the really 80s version of the drum loop. Let's take a quick listen. All right, so it's super on the nose for 80s, but let's say I'm working for a client or working on a project and the reference is Dua Lipa or Weekend. This is a great starting point. So layering, you can use layering in tons of different ways. I'd say the three primary ways I use layering when I'm working on drums is to beef up a certain layer or sample so it cuts through the mix more. And that's a different type of layering. You'll start to care about transient decay and frequency. Then there are those layers where you just want to create a more unique sample or maybe you want to slightly change the genre or vibe of the sample. And that's kind of what I want to do here with this kick or what I did do. So anytime you're layering samples, you want to be aware of frequency, tune, slash pitch, because you can have instances where they clash. So anytime you're layering similar sounds like a kick and a kick, those that's a little bit harder than say layering a snare with a percussion sound. It's a little bit easier to get those two different types of sounds to layer together. When you're layering similar sounds together, you have to make a choice. Which one's going to be this part of the sound? So with this kick here, this first kick, this is super 80s, right? It's almost too 80s. It, it sounds like straight up from a Lindrum. Now, I want to use a part of that kick, but I want to blend it with a slightly snappier, shorter kick. It's a little bit more modern sounding. It's this one. Still a little vintage sounding, but not as much. So to do that, I determined the pitch of the, the actual kick. Now you can use a plugin called Voxango Span to do this. It's a free plugin. So this was around an F or an F sharp, and this one is a C. So I used a frequency shifter to change the pitch to get it closer to C. And then I used an EQ to carve out all the low frequencies up till three, about 300, 350 Hertz for this really 80s kick. The reason for that, because I didn't like the low end of that kick, I like the low end of this kick more, but I really like that top end, the middle mid-range top end that gives it that 80s vibe. And now that they're tuned similarly, I can layer these together. Right now, I don't need the transient for this as well. I'm gonna leave the transient for the other kick. So we're gonna zoom in here and we're gonna apply a little fade in. So then our actual kick our primary kick gets all the love for the transient and we layer those two together and then all we need to do is adjust volume and we should have a less 80s sounding kick but it's still 80s right all right so play that in conjunction with our loop now all right so let's look at some layering techniques with snares because a little bit different so here's a really dry disco pop snare all these drums are from our pack new vintage. So that's where I'm pulling all these samples from. So I'm going to pull a percuss a percussion snare in. And I basically what I did was I carved out EQ because I didn't want it clashing with the body of our kick, added some bit crusher. And I'm using this layering technique to fill out the sound. It was a little thin and I wanted a little bit more space in the mix taken up. All right, so the next thing we're gonna look at is introducing fusion into your beats, into your grooves. I look at it like this. I'm working in a house track or working on a house track, right? Instead of just having 909, 808 samples and the prototypical sounds you'd expect to hear in a house groove, what happens if I bring in some bongos or some ethnic percussion, right? Just the idea of grabbing other ideas from other sources and making it fit with the genre that you're working on can go a big way. Check this out. All right, so to look at this, we're gonna to listen to a lo-fi house groove I put together with some loops from a few of our packs. So here is the lo-fi house groove. It's pretty standard lo-fi house. All 
Right now, I'm gonna layer in this crazy bongo loop with that. By doing that, I'm creating this fusion element. Now this is processed, so it sounds a little bit different, but here's more of this, the straight bongo loop. Right, and then with the effects, a little bit tighter, a little bit low, more lo-fi. So it fits the vibe of lo-fi house, but this is just one example of literally probably thousands where you could introduce some type of fusion element into your drum grooves to make them a little bit more professional, a little bit more unique, and a little bit more of a standout element in your track. All right, so the next tip and trick we're gonna look at is the idea of introducing or using Foley into your grooves, your patterns. Now you can actually use Foley as a complete replacement for some percussive elements in your, in your groove or your pattern, and that can actually be a really cool thing to do. It's one of my favorite things to do, so let's check it out in practice. All right, so we're gonna keep looking at that lo-fi house loop we looked at in the previous section because the hi-hat pattern was actually entirely Foley, or almost, in, almost entirely Foley. I actually used typewriter clicking sounds I recorded to make the hi-hat loop. There's one hi-hat <laughs> right there. So that is an example of where you can use Foley to actually replace an entire element in your in your groove, your track, or your beat. Now you can also scale this back, right? You could just layer in some Foley sounds on some of the hi-hats, maybe the open hi-hat. Foley does really well on snares and claps and even kicks. You can mess around with putting a Foley sample on a kick every bar, right? Or maybe every two bars, just to make things stand out. So to highlight how big of a difference this makes with the track and the beat, let's load in a classic shuffle hi-hat loop for house. Play that in place of the typewriter loop. Right, you might even be able to get away with playing both of them at the same time. Yeah, they'll work. Right, and that'd be an example of just kind of layering the fully together. But you can take that in a million different ways, and I obviously can't spend that amount of time on this video dedicated to Foley. But if you don't have any Foley samples, definitely find some, get some. There's a bunch on the internet. We even have some free packs that you guys can download. Link will be in the description if you need some Foley samples to layer with your drums. All right, so expanding on that, Tip number five is gonna be ambiences. Things like vinyl crackles, textures, sounds that are somewhat still Foley based, but they're more field recording, right? Maybe like the hum of a room or an office. You can, uh, maybe like a crowd talking. Those things can go a long way, either as whole sounds tucked under your groove or as sounds that kind of pop out here and there just to create this little bit of ear candy. So in terms of textures, you could use vinyl crackles, tape hiss, and hum. And that lo-fi track that we looked at a couple minutes ago is a great example of this. In the percussion track, there's actually vinyl crackles layered with it. Right, and that really helps give it that lo-fi vibe. Now, you can also use ambient sounds, like field recordings of a rainstorm or a courtyard or people talking. Another cool thing you can do is using an empty like recording the sound of an empty room. It could be your living room, your apartment, it could be a hallway, an office, a warehouse, and then you layer that into your drum groove or under your track, and that can actually set like a really cool emotional stage for the whole track. Now the next thing I'm gonna show you is something that I've never seen anyone else do, and I actually made a video about this on Instagram this week, and people thought it was pretty cool, so I thought I'd show you in a more uh, in-depth version in this video. So basically, anytime I'm working on a pop track or a song that's using more acoustic leaning drum sounds, I like to create an overhead mic version of that as well as a room mic version. You can think of these as like an ambient sound. So if you've ever mic'd an actual acoustic kit, you know how important the room mic and the overhead mic is to the overall sound of what you record. So here's a contact library 70s drums, and you can see that we have controls here for overhead and room. Sounds like this all together. Now if I turn off the overhead and the room mics, it's gonna sound a lot drier. Now, that doesn't sound bad per se, but it, but it doesn't sound as natural as a properly mic'd kit would. So you can actually create a really similar sound using one-shot loops from sample packs. So here's a great example. Here's a kind of disco pop drum drum loop from a pack new vintage. So 
So it's best to have the kick completely gone from the equation. If you can't do that, if you can't isolate it, you could use an EQ. Then what you're gonna do is you're gonna, to create your room reverb, you're going to cut out some lows, you're gonna use a transient shaper to remove some of the attack. Because if you think about a room mic being far away from the source, the drum kit in this example, it's not gonna pick up a lot of the transients, right? And then you're gonna load up another EQ, take out some of the high frequencies so you have the pseudo bandpass, and then load up your reverb. And you can decide how big of room or small room you're in, and here's what it sounds like. Now, the Overhead mic is fairly similar. So overhead is left and right. So there's really no uh, center material to it. So you want to remove the kick. Same thing. Remove some of the low frequencies, maybe even some of the mid frequencies with this. Take out some of the attack. Sometimes you can take out the sustain. I did that in this example. And then use a plug-in like Wave Center or a, a uh, mid-side multi-band EQ will do the job nicely. And you can remove the center content from the actual source material, your loop in this example. And you should get something like this. Right? Now, it's important that there's not a lot of stuff going on in the center of your stereo field for this overhead mic. And you want a little tighter reverb than your room mic. You put that together with your original loop and you get a very nice acoustic sounding drum sound. So there's one last cool tip and trick I want to show you with ambiences and textures. You don't have to have them play consistently throughout your groove, your track. You can actually have them become part more of part of the rhythmic bed of what you're doing. So I've played this loop a few times throughout the course of this video. Basically, it started out as this hi-hat pattern. And then I dragged in this really cool tribal chant, this male guy who is just going nuts. And uh, <laughs> I triggered it with a gate. So then it, I set it to where it would basically only happen on the eighth note values, not the rolls. And that's where that vocal sound is coming from. Right, so we're gonna do something similar. So here's my main hi-hat loop. So here's how you can set this up in Logic. It's a little bit different for each DAW, but you can use a gate. There's actually dedicated plugins that will do this, and I'll show you that in a second. But if you have a gate, you can just use a gate. Uh, so in Logic, you're gonna just duplicate your track that you're trying to trigger. So this is my hi-hat track that I duplicate. You're gonna set the output to no output because you're gonna use this to trigger the gate. So then you're gonna create your, or bring in your audio, your source material that you want to trigger. So here's a crowd loop. Turn off the gate. And then let's turn on the gate and the EQ, and then we play these together and the gate is set to that track. It's triggering it via side, via side chain. And there's that crowd loop with the same kind of pattern as our hi-hat loop. And if I play it with our hi-hat loop, right now we have a whole different vibe coming from our hi-hat. So if we play it together, And of course, you can blend to taste. So I will say, if you're doing this, it does work better on sounds that don't have a kind of a white noise to it. Uh, because this is a Foley sound, an ambient texture sound, it was recorded from, you know, people talking in an open space. There's a lot of noise to it. So that can make it a little bit harder to work with. Uh, usually more pointed and targeted sounds that are recorded more in a studio environment do a little bit better with this technique. So it's called Texture, it's made by Devious Machines, and it's basically an envelope follower that can trigger you know, samples. So it's kind of like a impulse response envelope follower, and that makes it a little bit easier, but it is a pretty expensive plugin, kind of needlessly expensive for what it does. So you could just use a gate like I showed you in this section of the video. All right, so now we're getting into the next category that I mentioned in the intro. We're gonna be talking about rhythmic elements. So before we've been talking more about sounds, the samples and how they contribute to a more unique professional sound. Now it's time to look at rhythm. Now on the base level of this, we're gonna have basic rhythms and complex rhythms. I'm not saying that every drum pattern groove has to be complex, right? Especially in a lot of genres like pop and mainstream music like trap, you don't have a lot of complex things happening. So so the trick is to add some complexity without making it overall too complex to where it doesn't connect with your listener. So let's look at a couple examples of that now. All right, so we're going to go back to that very first drum loop that we looked at at the beginning of the video where we looked at the basic 
kind of the noob pattern versus the more polished professional pattern. So the kick pattern, the kick and snare pattern in that is actually a somewhat complex rhythm. The kick doesn't always happen on downbeats or quarter note values, which, which some people, especially when they're just starting out, that's typically what they drift to doing. So if we turn on the click and we listen to this, Right, that on the third kick, there's this nice pickup in between or right before the snare. And then the second kick or the third kick happens not on a downbeat of bar two. It actually happens on an and, right? It's actually a 16th note and, right? One E and a two E. So that adds a level of complexity to the groove. Now, I actually have a version, I can actually make a version of this that is more straightforward. And we'll do that right now. So we'll just delete this. There's our kick, there's our snare. So we're gonna just take this and make it more of a standard pattern, right? On basically quarter note or eighth note values. So let's take a listen to this. Right, that's not nearly as interesting as what we had before. So you don't have to make the mistake, and I think a lot of Beginner producers make this mistake and even intermediate ones. They think that to make something more complex, you need more, more, more. Well, actually you can take it in the opposite direction. You can have more space, you can do less and less becomes more. And you can find pockets within the groove that makes things more complex. Now, of course you could add more to make it more complex, but I think this generally works a little bit better, a little bit more in your favor in terms of it's a little bit more digestible from a listener's perspective. All right, so tip number seven is going to be to humanize elements of your pattern and your groove. Now, this doesn't mean just changing the velocity, right? That could be one thing, but note length, sample length, even changing up the actual sample itself with things like claps and hi-hats and snaps can go a long way towards making your drum groove sound much more authentic, realistic, and ultimately professional. All right, so I set this up off camera just to make the explanation a little bit quicker for you guys. So I, I dragged in a finger snap, sounds like this. And we have a kick pattern with that snap. So I've already gone through and humanized it. Here are the things that you can do when you're trying to humanize things. And this works especially well with claps, snaps, and anything that's organic sounding. So the first thing is to change the velocity or change the volume of each hit slightly. And I, I've done that with each of these. Now, the next thing you can do, and this I like doing this with things that have more sustain, so this wouldn't be good for hi-hats, is I like to actually use a transient shaper to turn down the sustain on the sample. So each of these tracks has their own transient shaper with a different value for the sustain. And it just really helps humanize it. Now, the next thing I did was I actually changed where each hit happened on the grid. So it's not right on grid. This one has a little bit of swing. This one has a different value of swing. And this one's actually is right on grid. So those three things are a really great starting point. Now you can also change the pitch. And you don't want to change things in semitone pitch with this because it'll be too noticeable generally. But you can change things in what's called fine tuner sense. So this one is the actual stock sample. This one I've changed a detune negative 16 sense, and this one is positive seven. So just a little bit of a difference, but again, these things add up, especially when you do two or three or four of these techniques. Now on this last sample, you can see that it's actually kind of chopped up. I actually removed a whole part of the snap, and that's actually pretty easy to do with snaps. You can literally just find a section cut it out with your scissor tool. And you want to make sure that you do it at a zero crossing. And it's better to find like whole sections where it's like, oh yeah, here's a part of the transient. Remove that, drag it back on itself. All you're basically doing at that point is shortening the sample and removing some of the, you know, multiple transients that come from a finger snap. And that keeps it still sounding like the source sample. Right but it's different enough to humanize it. Now on this last one, I also have an EQ where I'm notching out some of the frequencies and that's enough to make it seem like, well, maybe the maybe the person who is recording this, they move their fingers away from the mic or they remove further back from the mic and it changed the timbre of the sound. So what you get is just this subtle difference. Now compare that to this version where it's just the same sample over and over. Right? It actually does add up in a very meaningful way. All right, so tip number eight 
is to use Swing. Now, a lot of people in tutorials, when they talk about Swing, they just show you how to add Swing in FL Studio, Ableton, Logic, or your DAW, and they just apply Swing to a whole groove. You can do that, especially if you're creating like lo-fi or boom bap, hip hop. You can add some Swing to the entire track, but you can actually just add Swing to individual elements, maybe a certain percussive element in your track, or maybe part of your hi-hat. Just knock it off of grid a little bit to humanize it and to give it more bounce and swing. All right, so tip nine is kind of building on tip eight, which is swing. We're gonna be looking at the idea of adding unique groove elements here and there throughout the actual pattern. Now this could be an offbeat percussive element, something that changes up the established groove. And the easiest way to show you would be like with a four on the floor house groove, or maybe like a disco pop groove. So let's check that out now. All right, so a unique groove element is such an open-ended concept. I could do an entire video about it, but you can break it down into the three categories that we're discussing in this video. You can think of it as bringing in a unique sample or sound. It could be something unique rhythmically, or it could be something that's more mixing slash process based in terms of effects and processing. So let's go back to our lo-fi house loop and let's listen to the kick and clap pattern. Every other clap hit is a different clap, but it goes back and forth between these two claps. Right, so that's an example that we already heard of a unique groove element. It keeps the listener's ears engaged. Now, if we go down to our perk loop, you'll notice that there's a couple, and I've cut these up so you can see them. There's this hit right here and this hit right here. These are an example of a rhythmic element that's a unique groove element in terms of it's changing up the established groove. If we listen to the groove that's established with our hi-hat pattern and our kick and clap, it's boots and hats, right? And then even with this, this perk right here, the first few hits, the first section of it up until this pink chop right there, it's boots and hats and it's kind of just helping, uh, helping along the main track. Nothing here in this first, you know, two bars or so, no, or first bar, I should say, happens at a different rhythmic point than anything else that's already established. But this pink one does. And so does the second pink one. So that's establishing kind of a gallop. It's happening on a different grid. And that's going to create a unique groove element. Now, if you're a little bit uneasy about creating that from scratch and you're, 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 you're a beginner and rhythms are difficult for you, you could just work with what's called top loops, shaker loops, percussion loops, and they can help you achieve that rhythmic difference. So for instance, let's pull in a track here. We'll create a new, new audio track and I'm going to go to our pack roses and let's find one that has a different rhythmic vibe than what we have. Right, so then what you can do is you can just start to chop things up. So I don't need more stuff happening on that hit. I already have that. That hit right there is though, these two hits right here, it's open in my beat. So I'm going to leave those. All right, same here. I don't need anything. I have two sounds, three sounds happening right there. So we're going to remove that. Right, but th this could remain, and this is this actually works really well. And I'm just chopping up a percussion loop to give it that unique groove. All right, so tip number 10 will be especially useful for any trap, hip hop influenced genres. That'll be hi-hat rolls. So instead of just having a quarter note or an eighth note repeating endlessly, you're gonna find points within the pattern where you literally roll it. Think about like a snare roll, but you're gonna do that with hi-hats. All right, so here's an example of a hi-hat roll. It's a great way to transition between bars. You can also pitch your hi-hat rolls, right? So I could take the pitch of this and we could change it on some of the notes, all of the notes. You can pitch it up, down, down and up. It's really up to you. It depends what type of vibe you're going for at that point in your track. So here's a pitch up roll. All right, so the last element of the rhythmic section which we're gonna be talking about is going to be turnarounds and fills, thing that, things that refresh the listener's ears before you repeat a section or maybe every four to eight bars so things don't become too monotonous. All right, so I pulled up that 
disco pop drum loop that we've looked at a couple times in this video. It sounds like this. So this is a great drum groove or loop in terms of being a candidate for needing what's called a turnaround. So turnarounds are kind of like simplistic fills. And I, I think of them as a way to just refresh the listener's ear when you're staying within one section of the track. Let's say you have an eight bar verse and the drum loop repeats for all eight bars and you want to do something to refresh the listener's ear, you could use a turnaround. Whereas a drum fill, to me, I think it's a little bit more suited, especially in electronic genres, to tell the listener something is about to change and something's about to happen. So I created a simple turnaround just by using the drums that are already there. So basically we have this pattern, there's four on the floor, right? But right here, I took the kick and then moved it back. And that's the most simple turnaround you could do. I could add a couple more kick hits. I could even add a crash on bar 10 when we come back around. Right, but that just, that depends on what I'm trying to do energetically. Now, if we look at the difference between that and a fill, what we're gonna do here is we're going to turn that off, just drag this back out. So now it's just back to our normal groove. Right, we can drag in a drum fill or make one. I just dragged one in from our pack roses. And we're gonna use this to say, hey, we're going to a new section of the track. So these next few tips and tricks, they all ironically center around the idea of stereo width. So you can actually have a wide pattern or groove, right? Your kick and snare, that's usually gotta be up the middle. Claps, sometimes up the middle, they can also be panned out left and right. But things like hi-hats, open hi-hats, percussion, foley, unique groove elements, those can move around the stereo image. They don't even have to stay static. Sometimes they can hit here, then other times they can hit over here. And it goes a long way towards making your groove sound a lot more professional. Now, expanding on that, you can also do stereo ear candy. And that's where you do things like where you actually shift the pan, maybe with an auto pan or you automate the pan, or maybe certain drum fills sweep across the stereo spectrum. So we'll look at a couple examples right now. We're gonna look at two different types of ways in which you can add some stereo width to your track. Now, we're gonna look at first, we're gonna look at a, and I don't know if it fits really well, but I just dragged in a loop that I know I did this with, and we're gonna check it out regardless. So we're gonna look at that trap loop. And we're gonna look at, we're gonna focus on this right here. So it's just a perk loop, and the perk is bouncing left, right, left, right, basically. And you can achieve this by automating in the pan, or you can use an auto panner. Now, this again, might not work with this track. Kinda does. I don't love it though. But even the initial sauce loop that we had, certain hits are left and right, but not super wide left and right, like that other one we just looked at. So that's one way in which you can create this kind of stereo width with your beats and your grooves, is you can have a whole perk loop, a top loop, or some rhythmic element that repeats that goes left, right, left, right, and the width is up to you. It can be super wide or it can just be a little bit wide. All right, so another variation of that would be instead of having a whole loop that's panned left, right, left, right, left, right, you could have some random variation left, right with some percussion samples. So here's an example where we're gonna go left, right, center. And this is going back to one of our disco pop loops. Right, and it's more open. It's not a consistent loop. It's just kind of more of the ear candy sounds. So it's not as noticeable as I would say the other uh, in the other one, but it can be a great way to, especially if you have a monotonous loop, like a four on the floor type vibe, to really switch some things up and keep the listener engaged. And you don't have to have it happen that often to achieve that. All right, so the last section, the last component of this is going to be the actual mixing and the processing, right? Now, if you've done a good job up until this point, the mix isn't that hard. Obviously, EQ and compression to get things to glue together and sit together, right? But on top of that, in terms of creative processing, really reverb, delay, and saturation go a long way. You can saturate a group bus, you can saturate just your snare, just your kick, just to get things to hit how you want them to. But if you wanna get more creative with it, you can dive into more of the spatial effects like reverbs and delays, and let's take a look at how some of those things can really make a something as simple as like a snare or a percussive element in a groove stand out. So I could probably do an entire video where we 
just look at creative drum processing. But there's a couple things I do want to show you to just to finish this video up. Obviously, you can mess around with all the things I just mentioned. But here's two things that I think are pretty applicable to a wide range of genres. Now, the first one works really well when you're working on anything that's four on the floor base. So what you're going to do is you're going to load up a delay onto one percussive element in your groove. And you're going to load up a dotted note or a triplet note value. And then that's basically it. There it is. And then you have this little moment in time in your groove where you're kind of getting this kind of polymeter going on, where you have this established four on the floor, quarter note, eighth note heavy vibe. And now you have this dotted note just kind of blipping in and out. It's a very easy thing to do. It's a very efficient thing to do. And it's a very powerful thing to do. All right. So the next thing we're going to look at is the use of a transient shaper when you're working with loops. So a lot of the times when you try to drag in a loop, like a hi-hat loop, percussion loop, or a top loop into your track, you might think it doesn't fit. And it might not fit just because there might be too much sustain to a lot of what's going on, especially with hi-hat loops. For instance, if you think about a hi-hat loop, closed hi-hats, you really what you're really after is the transient information, right? Not really necessarily the decay and the sustain unless there's a bunch of ride symbols and open hats. So from that perspective, you can use a transient shaper to tighten up the response. Here's a great example. Here's a jacking hi-hat loop. And I'm going to turn on a transient shaper and I'm actually going to automate the sustain up and down in a way that fits the track. So it's going to be at a point, a resting point of negative 48%. So it's going to be a lot tighter sounding than what we just heard. And then what you can do is you can automate in the parts that open up. And what this does is it tailors the loop's response in terms of decay and sustain to the pocket that you have open with the audio that you're, or with the beat that you're already working with. As opposed to it just being super open and taking up too much of that space. All right, so like I said, I could keep trucking on and on, but this video has gotten long enough. So if you guys follow a lot of these tips with your drums, you should not have boring drums. You should have professional sounding drum grooves and patterns in your music. All right, so that's gonna sum up this video. If you guys have any questions or comments, you can post those below and we'll get back to you as soon as we can. If you guys aren't subscribed to our channel, you know the drill. Hit that subscribe button. The support really does mean a lot to us. And if you guys haven't ever checked out our website, echosoundworks.com, definitely head on over there. There's a ton of free content, samples, loops, and presets. And of course, there's some premium sound sets and sample packs as well. And lastly, if you guys use Instagram, consider giving us a follow. We run a lot of contests, giveaways, and promotions on that platform. And I think you guys will like what we're doing over there. All right, thank you for watching. I'll see you next time.